Ha. So we're really happy to be here, is essentially what Sean shared. And it was a really warm welcome to share with you that how grateful we are to be walking on this ground today with each of you and our deep appreciation for our ancestors, for the Skohopmish, the Tsleil-Waututh, the Musqueam people, and those that have walked here before. And Sean said, we're going to walk very gently, we're going to walk carefully, and we're going to walk kindly. And today we get to be with you as leaders, as health providers, as mothers, as fathers, as grandparents, as children, as sisters, as brothers, to stand together and really consider where we've been. And what Sean said is our hearts are so full. We're so happy to be here. And it's been hard. It's hard work. And it's made for not an easy journey to get here today, including learning how to turn on a microphone, not pressing a mute button on Zoom, and not seeing back ourselves in a square. So even those are hard patterns, short patterns we've created, they're hard to break. And really, Sean expressed the gratefulness of the journey of each of you and of being here and where we come from. And so he shared our names. I'm Ya'ak Chamataksa. It's a name that's been bestowed and it's both gifted and it's one that I'm now required to uphold. And it means makes harmony through love. And Sean shared his name, which is Aapwaik. It's his sixth name? Seventh. Seventh name. And we get these names at different stages, and we don't choose them. We get given them. And so Aapwaik means says the right thing. So I have to bring harmony through love. He has to say the right thing. It's both what was seen in us and what is being encouraged in us. So not an easy space, and we will. We say we're consciously incompetent. We will trip. We will fall. We will say we're sorry, and we'll keep, we'll keep growing into those names. And so that, that is a bit of the introduction that, that Sean has shared. And he said the chachamata, the, the healers, the helpers, in our teachings, those are the most important people. There is no higher than the healers and the helpers. And it's with great training and with great work that we get to those spaces. And so... This is a little bit of our introduction of, of how it is that we come to be with you completely humbled, walking carefully and quietly, but also with absolute joy and enthusiasm. And Stephen shared that he's got a bit of optimism. We would share we've got just overflowing optimism. So hopefully at the end of a of big two days, we can instill just a little bit of that joy and that hope that comes when in our teachings we come to really lift up and encourage. Sean says, Klawa Istath, we push up against. And that's what each of you have done in your roles, in your networks, in your individual selves, in your teams. You've taken this time to push up against, to challenge the systems that you're within, that you're part of, that you breathe life into, in a gentle and kind way so that you see innovation. And I see Anton here, and we went to your, your session. And it was so fun to go, and, and for Sean and I, we are not experts in chronic conditions, um, other than political chronic conditions, <laughs> and how we could really see those intersections of the importance of what we're here to share, which is about compassionate leadership. We need one another. 
We need one another. It's the human factor, I heard Anton say, that's that secret link to why a certain change in care can lead to these phenomenal effects. And for coming together, Christina shared, you know, what's so important and exciting is that we're part of a community here. And we really needed to come together. We watched the video that welcomed you in yesterday. And it was hard to watch. It was important to watch, and it was hard to watch. And oh, our hearts hurt for you, each of you. It hurt for us. I lost an aunt in December. My mother had a massive heart attack in January. It was an incredible time we've been through, whether it be through climate, through the, the so many things that we know each one of us can draw on. And when we watched that video, we thought, oh, wa, and I know Anton will nod, and we've got other that know this phrase, Dana will know this, so wa, is that you, Christine? Is that you, Christine? So wa, Anton? That video takes the time to see one another. We just saw Josh for the first time in person, and we were able to say, so wa, is that you? Now we know the VIP group, so so wa. What does sutwa mean? It's from our teachings. It's beyond the hellos. It's that idea that when we gather, when we see one another, we take the time. We connect. We connect first. And we don't connect from, you know, hi, it's good to see you. You know, what are you doing? And you keep moving. It's that, oh, I see you. I want to know more. How are you? It is so good to see you. And you really warm into the other person's experience. And that is in our teachings. When we walk through our village, even Sean and I, every single morning in our practice, because it's hard. We are not patterned this way, and we've been in the political world for a long time. And so about eight years ago, we decided to say, so, well, every morning when we wake up, we say hello and we greet one another, like it's been years. We do miss it sometimes. And I'll tell you, on those days are the ones that were most apt for disconnect, for a challenge, for a word, for a short falling, that something will happen. And so coming together, seeing that video, where for the first time you can see and say, oh, someone saw me. And you can say, that's me. That's me. So, well, is that you? And you have to always say back, it's me. And it can seem a bit, a bit of a call back and forth. But it's the warmest sensation. And we do that before we do anything else. Because how could we possibly get into good problem solving, talk about the tough moments without that? And for Sean and I getting to this journey, getting into compassionate leadership, Stephen so graciously gave you a big overview of the different things and different places that we've been. It started, I would say, maybe eight years ago, maybe nine years ago. We've been in human rights and activism and social justice spaces for our whole careers, going into high conflict spaces. That's a whole nother story about what drove us to the highest conflict. But that desire to get in there, to be in places where you wanted to see love and compassion and there was fighting and there was conflict and there was pain and there was hurt. And there is one event that I think was a bit transformational for both of us. And we were in, some of you may know this event, some of you may not. You don't really need to know it because I'll talk with my hands instead of a slideshow and I'll try and draw a picture. <laughs> but it was the Walk for Reconciliation in Vancouver. And it was a real culmination of, of coming together to talk about something that was really hard and to really gain that togetherness about we're not there yet, but we're going to see one another and see where we might get. And it was pouring rain. And anybody who's been in Vancouver in one pouring. of those really dark, rainy days, it was so wet. And so we've got our umbrellas, and we're trying to figure this out. 70,000 people came together in the pouring rain. Beautiful walk, beautiful coming together. And while we were listening, I think there was something that touched me, and it touched both of us. Bernice King was the keynote. So Martin Luther, late Martin Luther King's daughter was the keynote, and she is a most brilliant orator. And it was fantastic because she didn't know a lot about what the content of what, what she was talking about. And so she had the speech writer had put this beautiful stack, and both Sean and I were quite, we're not, you notice we have no paper. We write our keynotes or our things as we're in the moment. We talk about our frame. And so we were both in awe because we also both admire that. She had a beautiful stack of, of 
speech, and she got lost in the middle. And we could see it because we were part of the event, and she's moving through it. But a brilliant orator, and she drew on her faith at that moment and what she did know. And so she lost her place speaking about Indigenous reconciliation and the specifics around the event, and she went to her heart. And she, said, she says, and don't you get weary, because you're going to get weary. And I just, the goosebumps went up, but I thought, oh, we've been so weary. She says, don't you get weary, because you're going to get weary. Gonna. And it just, that was that moment, and we both looked at each other, we thought, we're weary. We love what we're doing, and we're weary. And it's embarrassing that we're weary. And I feel a bit ashamed that I got weary because I'm worried I don't care. But I care, but I'm worn out. And I'm not worn out, just I need a nap. Like, it's, it's, I'm weary. And I see Sean's tears coming because it, it was a real impactful moment. And then she talked about being at these banquet tables. And she drew on a biblical story that she had. And she says, you know, we've got these people, and they're sitting at two tables, and they come from different values, different beliefs, different systems, and they don't, they don't see one another. And there they are with this beautiful banquet and these utensils that are so long. And she reached down and with great emphasis, she picked up these, these uh, utensils. And she says, and you can't feed one another. You can't, you can't feed yourself. You've got to reach across and you've got to feed one another because you will starve. And it was so impactful for both of us because we came from a world of conflict, polarization, activism, freedom fighting, terrorism, just depends which side you're looking on. And our teachings are Hishukitsawaknish. Did I say that right? I'm Blackfoot. That's my ancestry. Sean's a Hauset. So I've learned, I speak a Hauset, I speak Nuchalnath at home, but that's not my, my, my first language. And that is about being interrelated. And it's about no matter, we're connected to everything. And so when we talk and we see that video, Christine, that you put together, where it looks at the climate, it looks at where we are as people, um, our global, our social, all of the interconnectedness, our teachings are that we're all connected. And it all comes to the health and well-being of us. And so when we take that principle and that teaching and we really think about it, when we heard that story, we thought, how is it that we can stop contributing to the hurt because we'd fought and Sean and I fought hard for what we believed was right and we knew it wasn't enough to be right anymore and it, we needed to take a break from that space because we were weary and we realized we were probably contributing harm even though we thought we were right and so when we thought about our teachings and the beautiful expressions of nature which of each we think of nature as that relationship out there. But what about these relationships? This is all nature too. And we need one another. And being right is no longer enough. And I think that's a good segue to kind of hand over to you about how it is that we got to this space now of what our new, our new way of working is. And so Heather Marie has helped to ground us and Tan Sutwat, we see each other first. It starts there, Sutwat, I see you. And I'm so happy to see you and be alive to supporting and contributing to the spirit of each other. I see my friend Richard Jock um, over there, CEO of the First Nations Health Authority. And it just brings me back to those moments, the walk that Heather Marie just talked about, and a story that maybe Richard hasn't heard me share, which is a story of bear. Because every good session needs a story about bear. And our people have a good story, too, about bear. And there was a young woman who was from the Atlio lineage in our ancestry. And her responsibility, she was encouraged by the people, was to go and build a weir capture system at the mouth of the Atlio River. Yes, it's the Atlio River, an historically abundant river. And so she set about the task that she was entrusted with and was proud to go back to the village and report that the weir's been constructed. We're going to be able to eat soon. Because as with any group, any society around the world, Resources, they fluctuate, don't they? They go up and they go down. The fish runs aren't always, there's a saying, you fish when the fish are running. You make sure that you go get them. And she went back to check the weir for the first harvest the next day and found that the weir had been torn apart. Oh, the disheartening sensations that come through when you've worked so hard. And people are behind you, they're relying on you, right, to get this done. They literally are going to be feeding the people fixed the weir back up, and went back and reported what had happened. Went back another time. The weir had been broken apart again. Lovingly, she set about to fix that weir one more time and went back. 
The last time, disheartened by seeing the weir once again, had been broken apart. Went back to the village, and the elder says, I think you need to go and stay overnight to see what happens. Sure enough, after fixing the weir one more time, who comes along down the other side of the riverbank but Bear? And she came because she's got a big family to feed. She went to harvest the fish because it was pretty easy to do, because it turns out that her village was a long ways away. So the Atlio ancestor started a conversation, which is what we still tell people to do today. You encounter Bear, you make sure you offer suit what? Is that you? You offer your greeting. And Bear and the Atlio ancestor, they had a conversation. The bear offered to put the young Atlio person on the back. And over three mountains they traveled. And when they were approaching the bear village, she took off her coat, her fur coat. And what was there but a person, a human in our likeness, who then started a conversation with the young lady to introduce her to the leadership in the bear community three mountains away. A long story cut very short. Our potlatches go on for days, so these stories are long and eloquent, much more so than I'm sharing with you here today. They ended up in an agreement that Bear would share with the Ahausitz the fish from the Atlio River, that Bear would have their side and the Atlio and the Ahausitz would have the other side. And that story continues to this day, and as my friend Richard and others know, the journey that Heather Marie and I have been on in Indigenous advocacy it led me to be a claimant on the topic of fisheries all the way to the Supreme Court. Because I thought that part of the story about bear was about sharing the fish 50-50 with the bear. And sure enough, we won in the court. One of over 200 court cases that Indigenous peoples have been striving to succeed at. And yet, we still have a journey yet to undertake. The part of the story that I didn't understand until we started our work going on eight, nine years ago, was that story is really more about understanding. Understanding the perspective of those that we have no idea what their reality might be like. Taking the time to literally see the world through their eyes and through their heart, through their tim muxti in our language, through their spirit. So well, to see each other in a way that's truly alive to be concerned with the well-being and the happiness of the other. And for our people, that extends to bear in this story. And it extends to all living things. And as Heather Marie has rightfully said, this is the most beautiful expression of nature looking back at us here today. What beautiful beings we see with hearts and spirits to Muxti. And that was an important story that took on new meaning and relevance for us on a journey of compassion, of self-compassion first, that the journey that we take is to journey those three mountains inward. My goodness, the journey, I had no idea of the plateaus when you start doing what Anton was describing in his work when he talked about transforming a community like Fort St. James and doing it through relationship, through seeing one another and working to really encourage deep understanding at the community level first and then building out from that. And so that story, you can see, it took two iterations to, to offer us a deeper learning and lesson about compassion, about understanding others. But it turns out that there's a deeper understanding that occurs within ourselves to take the time as Anton and his team are working on in Fort St. James to be mindful, to be self-aware, to understand the way in which we see ourselves, to become conscious about the way that we talk to ourselves, the way we talk to others, the way we relate to others, to examine in a non-judgmental way the biases that we might bring with us about maybe what bear was or wasn't, or the sensations of a fear that we have because bear is so different from us and so powerful and has the potential to, if feeling defensive, to really injure us if we overstep our boundaries. And in our work with Richard here to be a lightning for my you know, thinking about stories, it brings me to 2008, sitting in the House of Commons, Richard, when I was holding the hand of my late grandmother, and we were listening to the Prime Minister offer an apology to the residential school survivors in this country, which at the time was like a new conversation, but it isn't now. The, the country has been seized and transformed and now is aware of the stories 
the likes of which when my grandmother was listening, all 17 of her children went to residential school. And with the lightness of heart and with hope and encouragement, she held my hand and through tears and she said, grandson, they're just beginning to see us. They're just beginning to see us. So what? They're just beginning to so what? She was so encouraging. And I thought of the stories of my grandmother, and they also have taken on a new nuance because she said, you know, it's going to take all of us to turn this dark, heavy page in this, this dark chapter of our history. It will take all of us to do it, Anton. It takes everybody, you said. I was listening to your session. Anton's session really moved us. It was a really powerful contribution to the forum here today. And at the end of my political work, we were just exchanging political notes here. I fast forward to the 213-ish, right? Around then. And I think about the video that you saw, about being a part through the entire duration of a pandemic that's not really over, and of the heartbreak and of being asked to do more. And I know for myself what it feels like to be face down in the arena, bloodied from the battle, wanting so desperately to contribute to the world around you, to make sure that another child doesn't get hurt or injured in your family or in the communities that I was serving that was beyond Canada, because our work took us to a global sphere, advocating for the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples with world leaders around the world with that sentiment about if I can just make them understand, if I can just make them understand, they'll, they'll see the hurt and the pain that our people are experiencing. And things will change. And we did make some, some contributions. But I'll tell you, at that moment, I rolled over in the arena and I reached out for Heather Marie's hand, which I'll do right now. And we rolled over and we just looked up at the stars. <laughs> We looked up at the stars because we had, I had run out of runway. And anybody in this room who knows what it's like to run out of runway, the sensations of burnout or fatigue, or when your spirit just feels like you've, you've left it all out there. If you've been in sports, you've left it all out on the field. You've given it your all. You've given your 120%, and the spirit now feels really heavy. And it, it is really difficult. It's hard. And so we started with that, with here, ah, oh, ha, ha, oh, it's hard. We really care about the work that you've done for us, for all of our communities and our people. Chachamara is a really high expression of respect to all of you as our healthcare professionals and leaders, those who are advocating for patients, those who, are, who have spent years going through your training to accomplish the high levels that you've accomplished. And that was really the start, right, back in 2013 was just stopping to turn and face, look at the stars, bloodied and marred by being in an arena, wanting to make a contribution because intentions are not on the table. We want to make contributions that are going to make our world a better place. And ours was one about wanting to make it a kinder and a gentler, a more compassionate place. And so I'm just thinking about that moment because that brings us back to here. Because eventually you can't keep laying and looking at the stars, although we did for quite a while. That's right. And we just laid there. And then we took the time to really get curious, curious why we were in conflicts, curious about what it was that we were fighting for, curious that if we were fighting, were we contributing to harm? And it was a hard, we, we talk, Brene Brown used a term about rumbling and reckoning. And I would say that was our rumble and reckoning. And it had nothing to do with work or external change. It was about really figuring out our internal change. And we were blending a family. And I remember it was so, we were both lone wolves. And they said to us, well, you need to lean in. This, this therapist, because our therapist sent to a therapist of therapist, because they decided that they wanted us to go to someone else. We tried to take that as a, as a real privilege. That's right. We're still not sure. So they, he said to us, you know, Sean and Heather, you need to lean into one another, that's especially when you're hurting. That's counterintuitive. And Sean says, well, that's counterintuitive. And he says, um, no, that's normal. Well, that gave us a lot to think about and lay back down for a while and stare at the stars. And so then it led us to think and reflect about our work and about our journey and our lives and our teachings and neuroscience and what is it that we wanted. And thinking about, and I said to Sean, you know, I think it's the age of emotion. Now, this was about eight years ago. And there was something intuitively that we were, we were really sensing. 
And we said, it's not, we, all, we said in our work, it's not enough to be right. Well, how do we breathe life into that? Because it is, we, we know the Buddhist saying, you know, is it necessary, is it true, is it kind? How hard it is to actually breathe that into life when you're doing work that you love, when you're in systems that are challenging, when you're in systems that don't see one another, all of the ways that we can see this moving forward. And Sean said the aha. You know, when we need healing, and I think about this forum and the whole idea that we got to touch on it, we got to process, we got to feel it. We have to heal. And the only way we do that is we have to see one another. And when Sean's grandmother said, oh, they're just beginning to see us, I think for each one of us, it doesn't matter our context. It doesn't matter our teachings. It's a universal, it's, it's the humanity. Oh, we want, we want to be seen and to see. And that idea that if we could really see one another and how good it would feel to, when you think, Oh, I've been seen. And then to think about, how, well, how can I see someone else, especially when my values, my beliefs, my upbringing, all of the pieces, my, my access to knowledge, and how I formed the way that I see and my thoughts, what if they're completely different? Is it possible to not compromise and be kind and compassionate? And we would suggest it is. And the relief that came from having wanted to make change, but because we were scared that we might miss the opportunity, that we wanted change through fear or guilt or blame, and that what if we missed that chance to really save someone? And the relief that came when we realized, oh, if we connect, we connect first, connect before we direct, we connect first. If we don't, so, well, if we don't see one another, we don't need to agree with one another, but how will we ever know what it is that we're working on? And if I want my needs met, then I need to see if I can understand your needs without compromising mine. I don't have to agree, but I can be kind and compassionate. And I had this moment where I thought, you know, you hear these phrases, it's hurt people, hurt people. And oh, it took me about a year to two years to, rub, to rumble with that because I thought I have been hurt. How have I hurt in expressing my hurt? And that wasn't an easy one. And so for compassionate leadership, we spent the last eight years first just doing an internal journey and then getting so excited and saying, if we can spark just a little bit of curiosity, no one has to change, but just a bit of curiosity into how it is that we can deepen our relationships without compromising our values, that we can be in systems that are, we can see that they're not where we want them to be yet. We can see the power challenges. We can see the inequities. We can see the abuses. And we can be uh, non-complacent. We can be strong. And we can be absolutely fierce in the way that we believe in certain ways forward and do so in a kind and gentle way where we lean on each other, where we need one another, where we practice non-violent resilience. So it's not about getting tougher and getting harder and closing that heart, but we stay open, that we bring our teachings about love one another, care for one another, encourage one another. When we're in leadership, we gently push up on one another. We hope We teach one another, we listen to one another, we encourage one another. And so that's the journey that we're on right now, is looking at how it is that we can tackle complex challenges, problems, crises, and do so in a compassionate way, where we get to better understand first. We don't need to ever agree. But if we choose, we may be influenced. We may change and shift our perspective of strategy. Our needs likely won't change, but how we get them met may. And so for us, that's been the journey that we've been on, to talk about our klimaksti, that every day I want to contribute now to, I want to contribute to Sean's klimaksti. I want to contribute to the well-being and the happiness of each of your klimaksti, especially if we don't see things from the same space. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't have good boundaries and some relationships have to end because that is loving, that is compassionate because when we find that we can't break out of that self-pain space where it's just too hard, then we're contributing further to that hurt. And so this is with boundaries, this is with good relationships and it excites us. And I think that that will yeah, Heather, close us out. Heather Marie would say, we gotta go slow to go fast. I would say, what do you mean? I got to be on my 15 minute to 15 minute schedule that Richard Jock put me on when I was national chief. You know the schedule, Richard. What are you talking about? Go slow to go fast. 
Well, we got to connect, deeply connect. And we made the link to the teachings. Late grandpa would say, make sure, grandson, you have your two glasses of water in the morning. Wait, gosh, make sure you say your gratitudes for the day. Greet the day, he would, he would, he would encourage. All the neuroscientists tell us, you know, it's, if we got a dehydrated brain, make sure you're having your water today. The neuroscientists will tell us that it's more difficult to regulate ourselves. It makes sense. It makes sense to truly take care of ourselves, as we heard in the video. Find ways to nourish yourself. Get reconnected after a year of the pandemic. Get together in Vancouver with people who are in your community, people who are in your tribe that are doing similar work so you can truly see one another, truly nourish one another. Watch the birds, late grandpa would say. They'll teach you about life. Watch them. He pointed out two birds that were in conflict. Anybody been in conflict in the workplace or at home? We know a little bit about how it feels. It doesn't feel good. Watch the birds, he would say. We were finding these gems of unconscious competencies within our teachings that we believe so strongly are in every one of your backgrounds, every one of your teachings around the globe has stories about relationship, about the importance of it, about stories about needing to feed one another, about striving to really understand one another. So difficult. Why is it so difficult to do what Dr. Bonnie Henry would say in the, in the sandwich boards, which is to what, be calm and be kind? It's really hard to be calm. It's really hard when we don't understand what's driving us, the activators within our systems, if we have lots of ACEs. Who came up with the term ACEs? I didn't know that term until I started interacting with the medical community. The issue of childhood, um, adverse childhood experiences. I didn't know mine were adverse. They were common in my pe amongst my people, common. I didn't know how it impacted the development of my system and my inability to regulate, my inability to think or the constant state of terror and anxiety that I felt I was in. The hypervigilance, which, by the way, creates a great system for winning elections. Make no doubt about it. It creates the ability to really read what's going on out there, and it's exhausting. Anybody feel exhausted because they're also hypervigilant? You see what's going on. That's where I come from, and there's terms for it and acronyms. ADD, there's a whole bunch of them. The toughest ones are around depression and feeling sad, but not even knowing that you're feeling sad, and not even having a lexicon, I feel fine. Uh, I'm just tired. Those sensations, the inability to understand and describe how it was, we're feeling in our timuxti, but we're feeling sick as well. We're feeling down, and we're feeling low, and it hurts, and it's really hard. And what we say is it is hard, because as of this moment at the end of the forum, we got a fresh start. You hit the reset button right now. We got an opportunity every moment that we get into our mindfulness, Anton, the way you described about your teams, being mindful and becoming aware of what's going on within our own systems and the power. It's scary to think about the incredible power that we have within our own. I would bump into a plateau internally that I didn't even know it existed. I thought, well, I've come to the end of, and then a new plateau would emerge, something that I had completely, was completely unaware of about the way in which my, my body would react. And so I don't go into um, a hospital setting without holding Heather Marie's hand because I need help regulating. It takes me five tries to get my blood pressure because of my trauma in certain institutional settings. And so when we, when we begin to get to know them, we can put up the bowling bumpers. We like to talk about bowling bumpers. It doesn't need to be that hard. If you're gonna go bowling and you need bowling bumpers, put them down. And so with the work we do, we encourage gentleness. It's changed in the area even of therapy. They used to have you have deep somatic experiences with your trauma. They encourage you to touch on it. Touch on it so you can do, as Doug Nall says, you validate yourself. And if you're lucky, you validate with somebody else. And you get what's referred to as an existential hug. You touch on it. And some of you have experienced this here in a forum with people that you care about, that you're close with. You have people in your intimate lives for whom you can go to. And we're gonna encourage this healthcare system to continue to reflect about its roots, like we have, to accomplish what we've done, Richard, in the work of indigenous advocacy, which is to arrive at a more cohesive, historical, integrated narrative. What we did is we paused, we turned over, we looked at the stars, and what we recognized is that in that old adage of a story, the leaders who went to the advisors, and the leader says, my people aren't healthy. And each advisor had a fix. Well, we got to do this over here. and um, Maybe it's a skateboard park for the kids over here, and that'll do it. Or maybe we need this. And the last advisor is the one that was really listened to by the leaders. And it was, leader, you, for your people to be healthy, you need to be healthy. 
And that's the journey that Heather Marie and I wanted to reflect on briefly as we close this out. That when we talk about compassionate leadership, the idea of healing together or emerging stronger is it starts with self. It starts with becoming non-judgmental, objective observers, and being kind to yourself. I didn't know what I didn't know when I was in my earlier part of my life. I think back to moments, and I can't go back there, so I have a sense of pride. We have a sense of pride for the journey that we've been on. It's come full circle for us, Heather Marie, right, with health, because we contributed to the iteration of transformation of health with First Nations and the work that Richard leads today. We're grateful to be in a room with you as Chachamada, as leaders. And to see Anton and other health leaders talking about that journey of looking at yourselves first. That for us to be effective to be leaders with others, we have to be effective to be leaders with ourselves. To understand the things that might activate or trigger us, things that interest us. To become really aware about how it is and be seized with taking responsibility for ourselves and be responsible to others. We can't be responsible for others. That's their responsibility. Let's not take away the responsibility of others to be responsible for themselves. Take responsibility for ourselves to create emotional, psychological safety and wellness and well-being. To inspire a shift to, as Heather Marie said, the age of emotion calls for us to understand how it is that we feel. And emotions don't lie. My thoughts might, but the emotions don't. I am feeling what I'm feeling. And right now, I think we're both expressing sensations of hope you started out with, of optimism, of excitement. And, and I still see my granny, my, my late granny, who was so encouraging, even having gone through what she did. She believed, as you believe here, that by doing this work together, and only by doing this work together, can we accomplish what it is that we're striving for. She put her hands, she put her hands, and she was like, I'm, you can see how tall I am. I don't have to say my height. And my late granny was slightly shorter in stature, but a powerful woman she was. And she, she went, grandson, I had, this, I had this vision that this big, dark, heavy book, and I couldn't push it up. And my vision was it would take all of us. So Anton, I need your help. Put your hand up a little bit. Come on, push it up there. Oh, it's starting to feel lighter. Richard, come on, my friend. Christina, you're, the, you're, the, you're leading us here today. Can you feel it getting a little bit lighter? We back each other up. Put your hands up. Let's finish in this way where we're going to back each other up. Go ahead, push this heavy book. It's not me. It's my late granny is watching. That's our teaching. My late granny says, come on now. It's going to take all of us. But if we work together and push, just give it one big push now. And there it goes. That's the start right there. We're going to write a new chapter in the future of our communities and the healthcare system. We're going to recognize where we come from and we're going to go, ah, ha, go ahead, try it with me. Ah, ha. It's been hard and we've gotten weary. And as Heather Marie said, she was talking about Bernice King, don't you get weary. Feed each other, back each other up, support one another. And what we learned is, is that compassionate and empathetic skills, they're not soft skills. They're hard skills. And we've been practicing over 40,000 hours we've, de we've devoted to learning these skills. And it's taken that long for us to learn them. And we're so honored to have been invited into your circle. We've been so honored to be invited into your community, into this tribe, into this family that cares for our people. So thank you for the blood, sweat, and tears through this pandemic and for the work that you do with a system that doesn't always recognize it or nurture it or uphold it, but we are not cynical. We believe that there is true care and concern. We believe that the system leaders as well want to support you so that you can do the very best and be the very best person that you are. What? And so with that, chu, auna in our language, short speech, because our speeches can go on long. Short speech, auna, tleko, tleko, what? Thank you very much for allowing us to be here today.